I'm John Cooper. I'm consultant veterinary pathologist to Jersey Wildlife Preservation Trust, um, which is um, in the British Channel Isles uh, off the coast of France. And I'd like, first of all, to acknowledge the support of the Trust, the director and my veterinary colleagues, Tony Allchurch and Chris Dutton, in the production of this and other videos. I'd also like to acknowledge my friends and colleagues, Dr. Fred Fry and Dr. David Williams, for use of a couple of their slides in this presentation. Uh, the subject is invertebrates, and if we have the first slide, please. Uh, the invertebrates are a large and important group of animals, and I shall return to that in a minute. They're also of great historical importance. They've been recognized by cultures going back thousands of years. This, for example, this uh, design, this emblem, is one of the ancient Mexican civilizations about 4,000 years ago, and it's in the shape of a butterfly and invertebrates, particularly insects, feature in many of those uh, ancient Central American uh, civilizations and in their culture and tradition. If we look at the animal kingdom, we see that the so-called invertebrates, and it's a fairly loose gr grouping, the animals without a backbone, constitute nearly 90% of the animal kingdom. And yet certainly veterinarians have been preoccupied with a handful of species of mammal, one or two species of bird, and increasingly uh, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. But the invertebrates are the predominant species uh, in the world. There are millions of species of them, and many of those species are likely to become extinct before they're known to science. Now, why are they of importance to veterinarians and indeed to veterinary pathologists? Well, because they are of economic importance. Um, uh, they are kept as companion animals, pets if you like, they are kept for educational purposes, they are kept for display in zoological gardens, they are kept for research in laboratories, and they are a source of food or other products such as honey, silk, etc., um, for many, many cultures in many parts of the world. So they are very important economically, but they are also a vital part of many different ecosystems. One only has to look at the seashore here in Arabia, for example, and see the myriad of different shells of mollusks to realize the enormous contribution that invertebrates, in this case just a few mollusks, must make to biodi biodiversity, both aquatic and terrestrial biodiversity. And the success of the invertebrates of different types uh, owes much to the fact that they have been able to adapt to different uh, environments. Essentially, we can talk about invertebrates as being uh, terrestrial or being aquatic. And although I should be talking a little bit about aquatic species today, I'm going to emphasize the terrestrial ones because many of their disease problems and how we investigate them as pathologists uh, are rather different from the aquatic ones. But we mustn't forget that the majority of invertebrates are aquatic. These sea anemones, for example, uh, are part of a, a marine aquarium display and they occupy a very, very important uh, part in, in both marine and freshwater uh, aquatic ecosystems. On the other hand, uh, the terrestrial ones have been able to adapt to living on the land, uh, some to a greater extent than others. Some, such as the scorpions, for example, can live in very arid, dry conditions. Uh, they, a number of species of invertebrate that live in deserts can metabolize their own water so they don't need to drink. So we're dealing with a wide range of animals with a remarkable um, collection assortment of adaptations. Now, as far as invertebrates are concerned, we have uh, 30 or more phyla of invertebrates that could be covered in this lecture. What I've done in view of time is take note of what is on the slide at the moment uh, the major phyla of animals on the Earth's surface, and this is in terms of their uh, impact on the globe, their uh, contribution to biodiversity and, and various other factors, are the chordates, which of course include mammals, including humans, the arthropods, the mollusks, and the nematodes. I'm not, of course, talking about chordates because they're vertebrates, and I'm not going to talk about nematodes. I'm going to concentrate in this lecture on the phylum arthropoda and the phylum uh, mollusca, and then when it comes to pathology, we'll concentrate on the mollusks and use them as examples. Let's look at the first phylum, the phylum arthropoda. The term arthropod comes from two Greek words, um, arthros and pod, poda, uh, which means jointed limbed. And the characteristic of all of these uh, arthropods, whether they be uh, insects or arachnids or whatever, is the jointed limbs. And we can see this very well in the spider in Tanzania. 
It's got um, four pairs of jointed limbs, quite clearly shown here. It has the other characteristic of the arthropods, which is an exoskeleton made of chitin. And that exoskeleton may be very thick and hard, as in the crustaceans, or be much thinner, as in this case, or thinner still in some of the, um, some of the other arthropods, such as the Lepidoptera. The Lepidoptera, of course, are the butterflies and moths, uh, familiar, very attractive insects, but they also have a chitinous exoskeleton and jointed limbs. This particular picture is uh, important historically, as well as uh, depicting Lepidoptera, because it's one of the early series of peppered moths from Europe uh, illustrating industrial melanism. This is the normal colour form, the pale form, but during the days of uh, industrialization, uh, pollution and of cities in Europe and elsewhere, the dark forms here predominated. And it's only in recent years, with a reduction in environmental uh, pollution, that the white form has begun to uh, predominate again. And these were some of the early moths that were used in those early studies, an example of the use of invertebrates in labs. Now, what about um, the anatomy, the basic anatomy of arthropods? Anyone who's going to become involved in the pathology must, of course, have some understanding of the anatomy. I don't have time to discuss it in detail, but the key point I want to make is that it is not worthwhile looking at modern veterinary or indeed entomological texts for that sort of information. Most modern texts will talk, ab talk about the um, diseases, perhaps, the molecular biology, most definitely, the ecology of these species. If you need to learn about the anatomy of the, um, of the invertebrates, in this case the arthropods, go back to the old text. This, for example, is a page from an old zoology book, a dissection of a cockroach here showing the different anatomy. It's in this sort of, picture, uh, this sort of uh, publication that one will, for example, learn about the Malpighian tubules, their role in excretion, learn to identify them, and so on. The message is clear. Go back to old books, old publications, the heyday of uh, the study of the anatomy of, the, of these creatures. Let's move on then to the next phylum, which is the phylum mollusca. Here we have a, a Latin rather than a Greek word coming from the Latin mollis, meaning soft. And it's a reminder that the skin, the surface of the, of the mollus, is very soft. And indeed, more than just soft, it's very mucous. The uh, typical uh, terrestrial mollusk is, uh, is depicted here. This is a giant African land snail, an Akatina snail. It's actually one that is egg-laying, and you can also incidentally see its pneumostome through which it breathes here. But you can see in the picture how uh, soft, or you can imagine how soft and certainly how mucous uh, the, the, the surface of the, of the skin is there. The other main group, and they're closely related, of terrestrial mollusks are the slugs, and there are two slugs feeding here, and here you can see very nicely the little droplets of, of mucus secretion um, on the surface, a reminder again of how important that skin surface is, and indeed how vulnerable it is to insults, whether uh, physical ones or infectious ones. The anatomy of mollusks is again fairly complex. Um, we have um, uh, available, once again, uh, old texts that will tell us about these um, uh, these animals, but at the same time we can use modern technology um, to, to learn even more. Uh, this is a picture taken about uh, 10 years ago in the days when the magnetic resonance imaging apparatus, the prototypes, were being developed in London, England, and uh, we were able to use the equipment on a number of animals as part of calibrating the equipment. And this is a, a living giant land snail, um, an MRI image, uh, the great thing about MRI, of course, is that the calcareous shell hardly shows. You've just got a bit of it down here. What we do have here, though, uh, is uh, an indication, first of all, this visceral mass that actually lies inside the, uh, the shell um, and uh, with the foot as well, and all the internal organs. You've got stomach and intestine here, and you can just make out the two-chambered heart of the, of the snail in this, in this picture. But as I said, in the context of the arthropods, um, the, uh, an interest in the anatomy of these goes back a long way. This is from London, England. This is one of many dissections done by John Hunter, the founder of comparative pathology in the 18th century, who, in addition to his studies on vertebrate animals, studied invertebrates, and this is a dissection of Helix aspersa, the common European snail. Uh, the specimen is well over 200 years old, but Hunter described the anatomy and um, his descriptions are, are, are relevant to this day. 
And again, as I said earlier, old textbooks will very often provide the information that is lacking in modern ones about the external morphology um, and, the, uh, and the internal morphology and the various orifices and apertures and so on that there isn't time to discuss at present, but some of this will come out during the course of discussion later on. Right, well, what about the pathology of, um, of invertebrates? Um, and uh, as I've said, I will emphasize pathology of mollusks using them as examples, and some of that is applicable to other phyla. Well, Mechnikov, over 100 years ago, is considered to be the, the father of inflammation, or certainly the father of phago phagocytosis. Mechnikov was Russian, but he worked in Paris, and in this description from his... Um, his seminal publication um, on, on comparative pathology of inflammation, he describes the little globules in the blood, these little transparent small cells that he first observed in a crustacean into which he'd introduced some fine foreign bodies and then observed these cells phagocytosing it, uh, phag phagocytosing them. And Mechnikov described these phagocytic cells um, and suggested they played a part in the defense mechanism of, um, of invertebrates and went on to see, as you can see here, in these animals, arthropods, mollusks, etc. He goes on to uh, talk about how the vascular cavity and the general body cavity uh, contains large numbers of these, uh, these inflammatory cells. So um, Mechnikov, 1892, has played a very important part in our understanding of defense mechanisms, not only in invertebrates, but particularly in the context of this lecture, invertebrates and how even they can respond to uh, physical and infectious insults. Now, we have been aware, of course, long before Mechnikov's day that invertebrates could mount some sort of uh, protective mechanism, some defense mechanism. And the pearl in the oyster, which is what you see here, here's the pearl in the oyster, has of course been recognized for thousands of years. And there's been no, um, uh, no, no doubt that we've, we've realized that in response, in this case to a foreign body, mollusks at any rate can at least encapsulate a foreign body. And that, after all, is one form of defense. Um, if we look at the, the history of molluscan pathology, in fact, the interest starts, of course, with pearls in oysters. But Heichel actually predated Mechnikov in his studies of, um, of mollusks, and he demonstrated that carmine could be taken up by, he didn't understand about amoebocytes as such, but could be taken up by cells in the body and be distributed elsewhere. And then Mechnikov followed shortly afterwards with his specific description of the amoebocytes. And then work has gone on since then, much of it in the, in the past 40 or 50 years, uh, relating to the role of these amoebocytes, these uh, phagocytic, uh, phag phagocytic cells, uh, and uh, they're, they're, they're also the role of certain other mechanisms in wound repair. And um, the uh, mollusks have been used for this because of their economic importance. The mechanisms that mollusks show that are relevant to our understanding of their pathology are listed here. The amoebocytes, sometimes called hemocytes or leukocytes, which are phagocytic and, and, um, and motile and so on. The fibroplasia, the ability to deposit fibrous tissue and to wall things off um, uh, with, with, uh, by fibrosis. Epithelial proliferation and migration. Deposition of nacre, that's the, the um, mother of pearl that is, um, forms a pearl or the equivalent in, in mollusks. And then various types of hyperplasia and indeed neoplasms have been recognized in mollusks. It's worth mentioning at this stage that all uh, invertebrates are to a greater or lesser extent ectothermic. They have no or little internal control over their body temperature. So most uh, mechanisms, including response to uh, organisms um, and uh, inflammatory responses and so on, are going to be temperature dependent. The higher the temperature, the more rapidly they're likely to, uh, to take place. Right, so the... Um, that's the background insofar as mollusks are concerned. As I say, some of that can be applied to other types of invertebrate. Now, the pathologist working with invertebrates can't work in isolation. He or she may receive material from invertebrates for post-mortem examination, for histopathological interpretation, but my view is that he or she should also be involved, uh, particularly where um, invertebrates are of economic importance, with um, uh, visiting um, where the invertebrates are kept, clinical examination, etc. 
Now, it's not always easy to carry out a clinical examination of an invertebrate. Uh, in 1997, I'll move on from that one. In 1997, I was at the Na North American Veterinary Conference in Orlando, and they had one of these magnificent inflatable fleas, uh, part of an advertising program. And um, I was able to demonstrate that uh, the jointed limbs quite well and carry out a cursory, but nevertheless, uh, uh, um, a clinical examination. In most cases when working with invertebrates one is doing the exact opposite of that and it may well be that the hand lens is one uh, is the uh, is the most important tool in terms of looking at the patient and detecting lesions etc. But much is uh, gained not just by clinical examination of the invertebrate but also as I said by visiting the premises where where the invertebrates are kept this, for example, is a commercial snail farm in Kenya, in East Africa, um, producing thousands and thousands of snails for the hotels and for, uh, uh, for, for, for the market there as, 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 as food. Uh, and in this picture, I'm, I've actually visited because they have a disease problem. I'd already looked at some snails post-mortem, but it was important to go and have a look at the premises and see how these were managed and see if I could pinpoint any, any particular clues as to, um, as to the problems. And again, the pathologist must be prepared to carry out clinical examination and to try and relate this to pathology. Uh, here, for example, these are European silk moths, the emperor moth. Uh, the one at the top is, this is part of a colony. The one at the top is a normal size, normal development. Uh, the other three are clearly not any stunted. Uh, they have a rather flaccid look, discoloration, etc. And a sign like this, a straightforward comparison, can very often um, be an indication of, um, of an infection, a viral infection, a bacterial infection, etc. So basic principles in terms of assessing a group of invertebrates can play a large part uh, in, in at least getting uh, some preliminary idea as to whether some uh, infectious disease is involved. Even behavior can be quite important. Uh, here we have, again, some farm snails, uh, some with a, a strange abnormality on the right, a stunted appearance, a loss of color, uh, rather matte appearance, uh, almost a developmental abnormality in contrast to those that are uh, relatively normal on the left. Uh, I put these out for the photograph to illustrate the morphological differences between the normal and the, and the sick ones. Within 30 seconds of taking the picture, um, this happened, and those that are normal were beginning already to move and to climb over um, the syringe and so on there, whereas the ones on the right uh, were clearly uh, n not at all active. So even such things as behavior, activity, etc., may be useful clinical uh, indicators of uh, health or absence of it. Sometimes the findings may be almost pathognomonic. For example, in this picture we have a, a fly, a dipteran uh, uh, insect that has died on the top of a plant, and I've just snipped the plant off and, and, and photographed it. Um, this is, uh, as I say, almost pathognomonic. When insects die in a high uh, on top of a plant, um, they are almost invariably infected with an infectious agent and very, very often with a fungus. This is called negative geotropism. Some people call it the summit syndrome because the creature, once it's infected, its behavior changes and it climbs to the top of a plant, it there dies. And of course, once it dies, the fungus, the spores can be uh, shed over, over a long distance. So behavioral traits like that, where the animal is found dead, may be a clue as to the, um, as to the actual um, uh, cause of the problem. We can, uh, that incidentally was a fung caused by a fungus called Entomophora. That's one genus of a very large group of fungi that are an very important pathogens of invertebrates. We can take samples um, from, our, um, from our invertebrates. Here we have a Mygalomorpha tarantula spider having a swab taken. This is a moistened calcium alginate coated swab of a lesion on the spider. And these can be dealt with in the same way as, um, as other uh, samples in in terms of culture, etc. There's various other things we can do. Uh, we can take, um, in the case of mollusks, we can uh, take samples, of course, uh, surface samples for swabs for bacteriology, etc. But we can also, as in this picture, take hemolymph samples. A close up shows the technique. I've got my needle into, I've gone through the foot of the snail here, and the needle is actually in the body cavity, in the salomic cavity, and I'm actually withdrawing uh, hemolymph. The hemolymph, of course, is the blood of um, mollusks. It ha contains hemocyanin, not hemoglobin, and it has this rather 
um, uh, but this faint blue, rather attractive colour. And these hemolymph samples can be used, they can be cultured, one can do protein estimations, uh, one can do cytology on them, and indeed just a wet preparation you can see the amoebocytes moving around. So one's actually using very similar techniques to those that we would employ in mammals and birds and so on, and just adapting them to these perhaps rather more, more simple, more basic um, animals. Various other investigative techniques can be carried out. Uh, radiography is one of them. These are radiographs from that same uh, snail farm in, in Kenya and um, uh, just being held up to the light to illustrate one that you can get first-class radiographs of these uh, animals. And in, in this particular case where I was interested in uh, the shell and whether there were uh, calcium deficiencies, metabolic disease and so on, this provided a very useful aid to, uh, to, to diagnosis. So the, um, much of what I've said there can be applicable to other invertebrates, even though I've concentrated largely on, uh, on mollusks and on arthropods. For those in veterinary pathology who are daunted by the thought of having to deal with invertebrates, um, I think one can be consoled and to a certain extent encouraged by the fact that um, we have lots of uh, causes of disease, many of which are... Um, uh, similar to, to th those that we would list in vertebrates. I mean, this, for example, is a list of causes of morbidity and mortality in mollusks. And if one just runs down the list, most of these factors are ones that we would recognize as being uh, potentially uh, important in, in other species of animal, including many of the vertebrates. And I shan't list those, but they go right through from trauma and poisoning, right through predators, nematodes, trematodes, right down to fungi, bacteria and viruses at the bottom. So the fact that we're dealing with invertebrate animals doesn't mean that their diseases are necessarily that much different. We can also be very encouraged by the fact that one of the great pioneers in invertebrate um, pathology and invertebrate disease was the famous, famous Louis Pasteur. Pasteur was approached um, in the middle of the last century by the government of France and asked if he would investigate the disease or diseases that were devastating the French silk industry. One has to remember silk was very important to the economy of France and many other countries at that stage and it has been argued that it did in fact threaten the, uh, not just the, econo the economy, but the long-term security of that country. Pasteur, who was a chemist on his own admission, had never seen a silkworm, he said, certainly never touched one at that stage. But after a bit of persuasion, he took on the task and he became uh, one of the early pioneers in our understanding of invertebrate disease. He produced this two-volume work, Studies on the Disease of Silkworms, and uh, he applied basic principles, basic diagnostic principles. He demonstrated the transmission of disease amongst, uh, between silkworms. He was able to elucidate uh, methods of, of control and so on. And we owe him a great debt of gratitude for the fact that he was able to pave the way in a field that was very, very new to him. And in fact, um, much, of, um, much of what uh, is, is known now about invertebrate disease is not that new, although there has been a great upsurge of interest and activity over the past 30 years or so. Uh, some of the diseases of invertebrates have been recognized uh, for a long, long time. Uh, this, these, for example, are four larvae from a hive of honeybees. This is a disease that is called stone brood. A brood disease is where the larvae are affected and they're thrown out by the bees. And this is stone brood where the larvae, not the one there so much, but these look almost mummified and hard and dry. This and other brood diseases were first described 2,000 years ago by Aristotle and Pliny and well recognized at that stage. We, 2,000 years later, can go a little bit further. So, for example, uh, we carried out um, scanning electron microscopy on these larvae. A low-power pic uh, picture, a low-power SEM picture, suggests fungal hyphae, possibly, up top left there. And we, when we go on to a higher power, we confirm not only that, but there are these um, conidia, conidia fours, etc. And this is, in fact, an aspergillus species. Aspergillus flavus and sometimes Aspergillus fumigatus, which we all know from mammalian pathology, are recognized pathogens of invertebrates. And I would argue there's, um, this is an, an old friend, a familiar pathogen, and the fact that in this case it's affected invertebrates is of interest, but um, uh, is certainly of interest and, and makes us realize that we can extrapolate a great deal from other species. 
We have many other uh, diseases of invertebrates, um, many other infectious ones of course, but also many non-infectious uh, diseases. Uh, one of the most common of mollusks is a calcium deficiency because mollusks, mollusks require a great deal of calcium for their shell, or certainly those that are shelled uh, do, because they have a, a shell, a calcareous shell, made up of calcium carbonate, not calcium phosphate, and they have um, a requirement for calcium intake. And one of the early signs that there's a calcium deficiency in a, um, in a colony of mollusks will be that um, snails start to, to, to gnaw, to nibble the shells of other snails. And this has to be considered as a differential diagnosis in any disease of mollusks in which the shells are abnormal. Now environmental factors are very important in invertebrates because, partly because they're ectothermic, as I said before, and we're reminded of the susceptibility of invertebrates in the wild as well as in captivity to environmental factors um, by some ra a rather charming description by the biographer of St. Francis, who said of St. Francis of Assisi, he removed from the road little worms, lest they be crushed underfoot, and he ordered that honey and the best wines be set out for the bees, lest they perish from want in the cold of winter. I wouldn't advocate that we should all be doing that, but nevertheless it's a reminder to us that these invertebrates, partly because they're ectothermic, partly because they're small, are very, very susceptible to temperature changes and so on, and that these very often uh, play a, 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 an important part, either a primary part or, a sec or an associ uh, in association in disease in these animals. In the case of, I just mentioned briefly again, aquatic invertebrates, this is particularly true. And captive aquatic invertebrates in, a, in an aquarium, for example, are uh, confined. The, um, the way they are kept, the, the, uh, the way that they are managed, etc., it plays a very, very important part. Um, and in, if, if um, ill health or disease occurs in, in aquatic invertebrates, uh, a lot of the uh, effort should be put into looking at the water quality, the salinity, the hardness, the bacterial count, etc. Uh, in addition, of course, to looking at any invertebrates that are available for post-mortem or other investigations. When we're dealing with our terrestrial invertebrates, it's rather less easy to assess the environment that they're in, uh, certainly in the wild and to a certain extent in captivity, but we do have some ways in which we can do that. Uh, one way in which we can do it, and where the pathologists can play an important role, is looking at the, the shed skins, the slough skins of arthropods. The vast majority of arthropods will grow by losing their outer skin. This, for example, is the shed skin, a perfect shed skin, nothing wrong with this, of a red-kneed tarantula spider. Uh, and incidentally, this is where some knowledge of the biology of these is important. These spiders, when they shed their skins, they lie on their backs, and that is perfectly normal. Do not turn them over the right way or they will probably die. So one, the pathologist needs to know something about uh, behaviour as well as the pathology. But here we have a normal shed skin, a normal slough of a tarantula spider. The pathologist can look at this sort of material, can culture it, can do um, direct mounts of, of pieces of chitin for, to look for evidence of, of lesions, etc. These shed skins are a very, very rich source of information uh, when it comes to investigating disease. Sometimes it's a lot easier than that. Here we have a couple of stick insects from a, a large collection. Uh, the one at the top is perfectly normal with nice well-formed um, wing cases, etc. The one here has got crumpled wing cases and clearly, uh, these are both, both post-mortem specimens, this is a control one, and clearly something has gone wrong here. This is very straightforward. This is too low a relative humidity in that particular container. Um, and the one, the, the, the lower one has suffered from that and not been able to shed its skin and develop properly. Uh, metamorphosis is very easily affected by environmental factors and we should be aware of that. Now what about actual pathological examination of invertebrates? Well we have a lot of information available, a lot of data available from the field of invertebrate pathology but most invertebrate pathology to date has not been carried out by veterinarians who are interested in diagnosing disease and possibly recommending action to prevent it or control it. Uh, on the contrary, um, much of invertebrate pathology has revolved around uh, the need to control insect pests, to develop pesticides, to use biological methods of control for Lepidopterus larvae that um, perhaps are pests of, of foodstuffs, etc. 
And so while many of the techniques are applicable, the aim has been rather different. Um, we produced a little paper a few years ago putting together some of the available information, uh, which was in the International Zoo Yearbook, Pathological Investigation of Captive Invertebrates, um, and so this was with my colleague Andrew Cunningham in London, and that has provided us with the opportunity uh, to um, bring together the, the, the limited veterinary data on this, but also some of, the, um, some of the information from the more standard invertebrate pathology texts. But if I take you through a post-mortem examination or pathological examination of a mollusk, that probably is the better way to do it. First of all, if the mollusk or mollusks are presented for, um, uh, for post-mortem examination, they should be weighed just like anything else. This is an Acatina snail, one of a group that died under mysterious circumstances. So the animal is weighed um, and indeed in many cases, in my lab at any rate, is measured. Then careful examination is carried out um, of, the, of the snails. This is two from the same group. External examination, looking for external lesions, uh, looking to see, the look at the soft tissues, which in this case have contracted um, after death, etc. Um, a, a standard um, external gross examination, just as one would carry out with, with anything, uh, with any other species. And then the, s the snail itself is dissected, not easy when they are older snails with a, a very thick shell. One needs to have all the equipment ready and it's not a bad thing to wear goggles when you're doing this because pieces of shell can, can fly in all directions. And uh, here you see the dissection being carried out, pieces of shell being taken off um, and exposing the internal organs. Once the organs are exposed with a little bit of shell there, uh, this is where your knowledge of anatomy is important, and as I say, reference to some of the older texts will help considerably. This is also the stage, of course, at which samples may be taken. Uh, samples can be taken for um, bacteriology, um, they, um, both superficial bacteriology of the surfaces of, of organs, but also cut surfaces in exactly the same way as with vertebrates and cultures can be put up on the standard media. These are blood agar plates that have been with cultures from, uh, from Parchula snails, actually, not these Acatina ones. Parchula snails are, are a very rare speed, a group of snails, and these are different isolates on blood agar. Uh, we routinely incubate our plates at both 37 degrees and 24 degrees, and not infrequently culture organisms at 24 degrees that um, don't grow at 37. And this has to be borne in mind uh, with all ectotherms, but uh, in my view particularly with invertebrates. Now, culture can play an important part in, uh, together with uh, gross examination, etc., in ascertaining the cause of, of death or at least um, uh, some background uh, pathological information about invertebrates, but there's no doubt that histopathology plays a key role. And the preparation of histological sections, and I'm concentrating again on mollusks here, uh, there are various methods. I mean, the basic method is the same for each once you've got the material into formal saline, decalcification through alcohol, xylene, wax, and then H&E sections, just the same as mammalian work. But large snails are best removed from the shell, as you've seen in the previous picture, and representative tissues are sampled. Whereas small snails, tiny ones, either young ones or small spaces, can be fixed in toto in buffered formal saline, and uh, then one goes through the same procedure. But of course, decalcification is vital here, not always necessary there. So those are basic techniques for preparation of histological sections uh, from snails. Um, as far as the actual um, uh, sections are concerned, uh, standard ones, my, these are ones from mollusks, my standard ones are stained with H&E, but I very often do a PAS as well. The first thing, of course, is to familiarize yourself with the normal histology of snails. Um, and I'll just um, uh, illustrate this with one or two pictures. Uh, this is normal histology from, uh, from an Acatina. Uh, this is the radula. This is the rasping mouth part. You can see the little denticles, the little teeth on there, which are replaced constantly. Uh, and this is the rasping mouth part that enables the snail to feed, etc. And that's perfectly normal. The whole thing is averted, of course, when the snail comes out of its shell. So that's one part of, of normal anatomy, normal histology. Uh, here we have normal heart. You'll remember the two-chambered heart that I referred to before. It's not difficult to uh, uh, realize that that is likely to be myocardium. So there's the heart and there's the chamber inside. 
and on the left this is kidney and um, uh, quite apart from the, the, the arrangement of the, of the cells here, you've actually got some urates. Looks like calcified material, but it's actually urates here because the main excretory product of gastropod land snails is uh, urates, and that's what are forming there. But that's perfectly normal uh, liver, uh, sorry, uh, kidney and heart uh, of a snail. And then some, just some other examples. Uh, here, remember, snails um, are hermaphrodite. They have both male and female reproductive organs and can reproduce as both. Uh, here, though, we have part of the male system. This is the male, uh, uh, the male duct, the male reproductive duct, and you can see spermatozoa, the heads of spermatozoa, here in this section, a certain amount of autolysis as well. Some uh, tissues are better... Um, seen and interpreted not with H&E but with other stains. A PAS, for example, is best for the albumin gland. Uh, the albumin uh, gland is shown here and, and, and shows up very, very uh, well and this is um, a, a key part of the, um, of the anatomy of gastropod mollus. As in other species, of course, great uh, care has to be taken in interpretation of uh, sections and particularly interpretation when there's autolysis. I showed you a little before, but here we have quite marked autolysis. In this case, this is the digestive gland, or if you like, the liver uh, of a snail, and there's a lot of autolysis, even without much knowledge of invertebrate pathology. One can imagine that there's breakdown of cells, some rather pycnotic-looking nuclei, etc. there. Well, how about proper pathological changes, then? Well, we see these and we can use them to help in our um, diagnosis. We do, for example, quite rightly, see accumulations, aggregates of amoebocytes. These are amoebocytes here, clusters of them, to all intents, uh, intents and purposes, similar to a chronic inflammatory cell infiltration, not a chronic one here. These, this is a fairly acute reaction, but in low power view, they look very much as if it's a lymphocytic infiltrate or, or whatever. And in this particular case, it's adjacent to the gut and was undoubtedly uh, significant in terms of the, the cause of death of this particular animal. We will find other things in sections. Uh, we'll find nematodes, for example. Uh, these are nematode worms in section here, some transverse, some longitudinal, um, in the superficial tissues of this particular snail. And this can produce difficulties because many of these nematodes can live a free living existence and one has to be very, very careful to uh, try, and it's not always easy, to differentiate between nematodes that were there anti-mortem, which could well be significant in terms of morbidity and mortality, and nematodes that have invaded post-mortem. And very often the presence of amoebocytes is the key, because obviously anti-mortem they will stimulate a response, whereas post-mortem they won't. And then, uh, very much in the same vein, bacterial invasion, particularly if, uh, if snails, um, mollusks, uh, have uh, not presented fresh. And indeed, in some cases, it's best to have them alive and kill them, rather like fish, in order to get good material. Um, but in a case like this, there are, is an enormous number of bacteria on the surface here of the, of the foot of this snail, and these are all secondary bacterial invaders, but could very, very easily be confused for a bacterial infection in this particular uh, case. So there are some examples of both normal and abnormal findings in mollusks that give some indication of how they, and indeed other invertebrates, are not markedly different from, from vertebrates. We can apply the same basic principles. Our interpretation has to be different to a certain extent, but nevertheless we, we, we can start from the same um, uh, base as we do in our vertebrate pathology. But it is important to say that the, the relevance, the importance of invertebrates can't be overemphasized. As I've explained, for hundreds, possibly thousands of years, invertebrates have been studied uh, because of their economic importance, because of the beauty, the splendor of many of them, and there has been an interest not only in them in health, but also some understanding of the various diseases that, um, uh, b with which they could be afflicted. It's really only the past 10 or 15 years, perhaps, that the veterinary profession, and particularly veterinary pathologists, have started to take an interest in this subject. It was 12 years ago that an editorial appeared in the veterinary record in Britain, uh, which said the following. The public today assumes that veterinary expertise will be available to diagnose and treat disease and trauma, I don't like that phrase, but that otherwise okay, in all animals, including invertebrates. 
No longer is it content to be fobbed off with excuses of unfamiliarity. And in the subsequent 12 years, there has been a tremendous increase in uh, awareness of, sensitivity to, and, and, and interest and involvement in diseases of invertebrates on both sides of the Atlantic, here in the United States and Canada, and also in Britain and other European uh, countries. And I think this is important. Pathology over that decade has begun, or veterinary pathology, has begun to throw light on a number of problems that, um, that have needed tackling. It's played a part in, for example, captive breeding programs. I referred earlier to Parchula snails. Uh, these are Parchula snails. They're tiny snails. They come from the Murian Islands in the Pacific. Uh, several species have already become extinct. Uh, others are threatened or have disappeared in the wild and are now just being maintained in zoological collections. They are very definitely endangered, or all of them are threatened, and many of them are endangered species. And this is one of the species where an input by veterinary pathologists over the past decade uh, into finding out why these snails are not thriving in captivity, uh, building up a database on their bacterial flora, the appearance of their tissues and so on, has played a part in the successful um, uh, captive breeding and uh, recovery of some of these species. So that is a good example. There's also increasingly a, an input by veterinary pathologists into management programs of uh, invertebrates that are kept for commercial purposes. I've mentioned snail farms many times, and certainly in Europe, veterinary pathologists are involved in giving advice and investigating disease in commercial snail farms. Um, but there are many other examples as well. One from East Africa concerns butterflies. This is on the coast of Kenya. This is the Kipepeo project, which is a butterfly farm, as you can see from the slide. And this is one of a number of ways of making an important piece of forest habitat there of value to the local people. In order to conserve and to manage properly that forest with all its biodiversity, all its wildlife and so on, one of the projects that's been developed is this butterfly farm, whereby um, caterpillars and other stages of butterflies are collected in the forest by local people, these two Africans here, for example, who have also collected some food plant, and then these are kept in captivity, and then the butterflies that emerge ultimately are used for commercial purposes. They're sold to Europe or North America for collections. They're mounted into perspex and so on. Whatever one might think about the end product, because this is being done in a sustainable way, involving local people, it means that there is a chance that the butterflies, and indeed the habitat that they live in, will have some value to these people, and therefore they are less likely to destroy it and all that it stands for. You might say, what's the relevance of pathology to this? The relevance is that the actual butterfly farm, with its very intensive management, with its concern about parasites coming in and killing the larvae, with the possibility of infectious disease, viruses, bacteria, fungi, etc., has to be constantly vigilant. And, and I've been involved in giving advice to, um, to try and ensure that uh, disease does not become a problem in this very important project. So veterinary pathology has a role to play in that sort of thing as well. Veterinary pathology is also important, and has been for some time, in the use of invertebrates in research. It's perhaps worth saying that the research animal that's used most widely throughout the world is not the rat or the mouse, but it's Drosophila, the fruit fly, and, um, and it's often overlooked how many invertebrates are used in laboratories. If I can give perhaps a more spectacular example, the medicinal leech has come back into vogue, into fashion, over the past uh, decade or so, in human and to a certain extent in veterinary medicine. Here, for example, we have a medicinal leech that's um, um, attached and taking blood uh, from a hematoma under a skin flap on a patient. Now, the use of these leeches, which started in the early 80s, both in Britain and over here in the United States, um, has meant that um, it, this is a new tool in treatment of human disease, etc. And it is, of course, using an invertebrate. But at the same time, there's been concern about these leeches. There's been concern about whether they could transmit disease from one patient to another. Um, there's concern about whether they would, might harbour, as indeed they do, bacteria that might be a problem in an immunosuppressed patient. And I found myself, uh, over ten years ago, involved in London, working with medical colleagues on the health, disease, and the pathology of the medicinal leech because of its importance in human medicine. 
And an additional aspect, rather different from that, but it's becoming increasingly important that we mustn't forget, is the question, is the question of forensic entomology. Th this is increasingly important, and forensic entomology implies the, the use of insects from particularly from carcasses, from corpses, human corpses and animal carcasses and so on, to provide information on the time and sometimes the cause of death. And so forensic cases very often depend upon some understanding of entomology, of invertebrate lifestyles and so on. And because the veterinary pathologist is or should be interested in forensic medicine, this field also, certainly in my experience, is one where some understanding of invertebrates, their life cycles, what is normal, what is not normal, can be very valuable and um, uh, contributes a, a new dimension to our input into, into this particular aspect of, um, of comparative medicine. And then finally, we mustn't forget the point I started with, and that is the importance of invertebrates in many different ecosystems. With the um, de deterioration of ecosystems, the decline in global health, we are seeing uh, increasingly how important invertebrates are as sentinel species. This is a scene from the Gulf of Arabia, the Arabian Gulf, uh, where what was once beautiful water uh, with a, a lovely biodiversity in terms of animals and plants and so on is, is uh, deteriorating. And um, one of the first signs of this, this was a mangrove swamp, is a decline in invertebrate numbers and also in, in the proportion of different species of invertebrate. And long before that happens, there will be changes in the invertebrate population in terms of morbidity and developmental abnormalities and so on, where the, um, where the uh, pathologist can play a part. So I would argue, quite apart from the importance of invertebrates in captivity, um, there is a role to be played increasingly by the veterinary pathologist with an interest in this group of animals in promoting not just the health of the invertebrates, but also global health. Thank you.